I'm Andy Katz from ESPN, along with my co-host, Rick Klein of ABC News. On the latest edition of Capital Games, we're going to discuss what LeBron James has meant to Northeast Ohio with Senator Rob Portman, Keith Dambrot, his high school coach. Go to the ESPN app and click on the headphone icon to get our podcast. Welcome to the 2016 NBA Draft, where the league's future stars are born. With the first pick in the 2016 NBA Draft, the Philadelphia 76ers select Ben Simmons been compared in terms of skills to a LeBron James type of player. That feels good. Um, I feel relaxed and I'm comfortable with the system. Great coaches, great people, a great young team and I'm really looking forward to it. With the second pick in the 2016 NBA Draft, the Los Angeles Lakers select Brandon Ingram from Duke University. According to ESPN Analytics, this is the guy that is most likely to perform at an all-star level in his first five years in the NBA. Because of the body type, there's been comparisons to Kevin Durant. I'm focused on getting stronger right now. I have an strength that no one knows about, and I'm just continuing to get stronger each and every day. What's up, everybody? Welcome into First Take. Thank you so much for being here with us. Stephen A. Smith is off today. I think he deserves vacation. It's been quite a long season, but you are in good hands. We're going to have fun. We made it to the weekend, people. Yep. TGIF, Will Kane, co-host of the Will and Kate Show on ESPN Radio. George Sedano, co-host of George and Izzy on ESPN Radio. And to my right, our friend from ESPN New York, Anita Marks. Hi. How are we doing, guys? It's Great. so good to see you. It's I know. been a while since I've seen you. It's been a while. It's a little reunion tour. Yeah, all good. It's good to be here. You ready to get Team into Petty it? is going to be in the house again today. Team Petty. Hashtag. I saw it. It was trending, really? I feel like. At Hashtag Team Petty? We can only be so lucky. <laughs> oh, yes. We can only hope, Molly. All press maybe is good press. Maybe it will find its way. <laughs> okay. Ma maybe we'll talk about penmanship today. I love it. Let's start with the association. That was something you're very fond of. The Thunder are in standing pat waiting for Kevin Durant to decide what he will do in free agency. OKC traded, excuse me, Serge Ibaka to the Magic for Victor Oladipo, Ford Ursan Ilyasova, and the rights to Ford DeMontis Sabonis, who is taken with the 11th pick Thursday. The move gives the Thunder some added salary cap room with Kevin Durant hitting free agency this summer and Russell Westbrook able to hit the open market next offseason. George, I want to start with you. What does this um, excuse me, what does this mean for Kevin Durant in free agency? Uh, I think it doesn't change his plan, which is he's going to meet with a lot of teams. Because ultimately, I look at this deal, and personally, I don't know if I like it for either team, to be honest with you. I look at this and I say, financially, I get what Oklahoma City was trying to do, right? Ibaka's in his last year of his contract, can save him some salary cap space, all makes sense. For basketball reasons, though, if I'm Kevin Durant and I'm looking at this at Oklahoma City now, I'm saying, okay, Victor Oladipo's a nice young player, but he doesn't play great off the ball. He's not a very good shooter. He's excellent defensively, and he can get to the rim. Fine. But now I've lost Serge Ibaka, who, when we were playing small ball against the Warriors, they were the only team to out-warrior the Warriors for a stretch. We'd never seen a team go small and actually outperform the Warriors. And a lot of that was Serge Ibaka, because you're talking about a guy defensively that previous to last year led the league in blocks for about three seasons. He was a defensive presence, and he could be that again at the center spot. So... And on offense, he gave them an option to go five out. Everybody was live from the outside. Now the spacing can be clunky. If I'm Kevin Durant, I'm looking at that, I'm like, well, there's only one basketball. Like, how many guys are going to be able to get the ball here? Because Victor Oladipo needs the ball in his hands to make himself a, a player that's going to have an impact on the court. So for basketball reasons, I don't know if I like it. And I, my guess is Kevin Durant has to be kind of looking at it sideways, too. See, I, I totally disagree. I, I, I think the Thunder sent Kevin Durant a message saying, we don't want you to go anywhere. We were one win away from potentially representing the Western Conference in the championship to go up. And I'll be honest with you, I actually think the Thunder could have given the Cavs a number of reasons, a better run for their money for the championship. I think this, this Thunder team gets younger. They had arguably the worst two position in the NBA. I think it gets better with the moves that they made. And I'm going to give you some stats here. Um, Ibaka, rotation player, of course, was fifth on the team in player efficiency rating. And how about this? Blocks per game in 2011 and 2012, he averaged 3.7. Last year, 1.9. So his production has diminished. I, I, I really think, I think the Thunder have gotten better, and I think they need to do everything and anything they can to try to get KD to stay in Oklahoma City because he is going to be taking those meetings whether it's the Knicks, the Warriors, whatever the case may be, they need to get better, and I do feel they got better. 
I think this is a massive home run for the Thunder. I think this is a hands-down, absolute, clear winning trade for the Thunder, and for three reasons, but one primarily. I think this means the likelihood of Kevin Durant staying in Oklahoma City is much greater. You may not like the trade that much, George, but I think Kevin Durant does. And I think they did more, Anita, than send a message to Kevin Durant. I think they talked to him. I think Sam Presti had to have run this trade idea by Kevin Durant. Your franchise star, top two, three player in the NBA, is entering free agency, and you make a core changing move? You don't think they'd run that by this guy? You don't think Sam Presti would call up Durant and say, hey, what do you think about Ibaka for Oladipo? And if they ended up making the deal, you know what that tells me? Durant said, yes, I'm in on that deal. Hmm. Yes, thus increasing the likelihood he stays in OKC. He saw a deal, it was run by him, he gives it the stamp of approval. Doesn't mean he's definitely going to stay, but it means he's more likely to stay. They did something that he likes. That's the main reason this trade is a complete win for the Thunder, because it increases the likelihood that Kevin Durant is in that uniform. Just two other quick points. Let's say it doesn't work out. Let's say Durant leaves. This is still a win for the Thunder, because... George, I think what happens here is you have given yourself upside. I hate that word. We use it in sports all the time. All the time, but you Let's have traded. Let's take a shot. <laughs> you traded for young upside. You took Serge Ibaka and turned him into not only Oladipo, who's 24 years old, was the number two pick, what, two, three years ago? He's been in the league two years. You got not only Oladipo, who's averaged 16, 17 points a game. You got DeMontis Sabonis, who's been a very, very good player. Sabonis averaged 19, four, 19 points, 14 rebounds, and three blocks in the NCAA tournament this year. We know he comes from NCAA blue blood lines. Of his dad's Arvita Sabonis. The guy can play. I think you make a very good on-the-court analysis, George. I think you lose something with the Baca. But ultimately, you gain more. You do lose a stretch four. You still have Steven Adams to play defense. You have some bonus to grind it down low. And you get Oladipo, and you increase your likelihood of Durant. Home run. See, here's why I, I don't think it's a home run. Um, you know, you guys feel like, oh, it's, it's giving him an opportunity to, to make him feel like they want him there. And here's the other problem. I, I don't buy that, number one. And number two, they didn't run it by him. Anthony Slater, who covers the Oklahoma City Thunder for the Oklahoman, said they didn't run it by him. So that in itself kind of makes me pause a little so bit. So hard to believe. That is not. I mean, we're going to. The guy who covers the team. Yeah, no, 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 I'm not. Yeah, so it's like. Not saying, I'm not saying Slater is wrong. I'm right. saying Presti's not a moron, and it would require me to believe that because if you made a move like this without asking Durant. But he's done it before. If you made he's a move like this without it, to without risk, it. that would increase the risk of losing Kevin Durant. Sam Presti is clearly not the genius we thought he was. Well, Sam Presti is still one of the best GMs in basketball. He's one of the best drafters in basketball. He's also one of the best young, young, uh, talent evaluators of young talent. So maybe this move is a precursor. He thinks, I probably will lose Durant. Mm -hmm. I may lose Westbrook. So i got to replenish the roster in one way, shape, or form. To me, that looks like what it could be. It couldn't be a countermeasure of sorts, potentially. But, yeah, I I'm going to believe Anthony Slater is one of the best reporters in the NBA that they didn't run this by Kevin Durant. As far as Ibaka's numbers are concerned, though, Anita, I, I'm with you. I understand. Look, he, but I think a lot of that, he didn't play as well as he had played in, re, in previous years, but a lot of that was style of play. With Billy Donovan, they played him on the outside more, so he wasn't there to block shots. He wasn't there to rebound as much as he had been in the past. So I think that there are a number of things that made Ibaka's numbers look worse than they did in previous years. And ultimately, if you're going to go all in for Kevin Durant, you've got to make him feel like you're going to win now. The biggest thing on Kevin Durant's mind, the most important thing, this has been reported by everybody, Stephen A. Smith, Adrian Wojnarowski, Mark Stein, everybody who's anybody in the NBA. Kevin Durant wants to win yesterday. And I don't know if this move gets them to win as soon as possible. I think Ibaka would have, would have helped them to get over that Warriors hump. They were this close, man. And they, again, out the Warriors who, that no one else had done that in the league to this point. Well, two things. As I said earlier, that two-position OKC worst in the league, this improves them in that regard. Uh, when we opened up the show, Molly talked about salary. But does it? Because I don't know if he's an off guard. He doesn't play well off the ball is the problem. He doesn't shoot the ball very well. Anything. If, if you are at the bottom barrel of the NBA, I, I mean, how can this not be a step forward? Oladipo is a sixth man. I, I'll, give, I'll give you that. If he can play the sixth well, man role, no, I like him better There's no better report that, that he's spot. starting, but even if he is the sixth man off the bench, it's definitely an improvement. I don't think that they're done yet. Molly mentioned salary cap. This helps him with the salary cap. Don't forget, Westbrook is going to become available in 2017, so that's huge. But, Will, you said that you think Oklahoma City is going to be okay if Kevin Durant, if Kevin Durant goes. 
Heck no, man. What I you, didn't say that. Yes, you, you did. You said, you said this improves them whether or not Kevin Durant stays or goes. No, no, didn't say that. I said as a secondary reason why this trade works, that even if Kurt Durant goes, this makes them better than if he... You have to admit, he's gone either way is my point. If, he, if but it but doesn't he goes, help, Let's face it, he goes. I mean... Well, no one would argue they're better without Kevin Durant. I, I know, I but certainly like, didn't argue that. No, no, I'm not saying that they're better, but like he goes. I mean... This is a huge step back. Yeah, oh, big time. The point I'm making is this. Who cares who they bring if in? Kevin they lose Durant, Kevin Durant. If Kevin I mean, Durant's they're going to not on the Thunder roster, this roster is better than the one with no Kevin Durant plus Serge Ibaka. This roster today, Kevin Durant over here to the side, is better. Now, of course you want Kevin Durant. That's my point to you. If I'm wrong, if they didn't, if Adrian Slater is exactly right. Anthony. Anthony, I'm sorry. Slater is exactly right. This was not run by Presti. Then it's still. I mean, this this was not run by run by Durant. I think the the move still works. I still I think it still makes them better than if Serge Ibaka's on the roster because the plus minus is this: you still have Stephen Adams, you add Sabonis, which makes up for the loss of Ibaka, and then you add Oladipo. And the difference between Oladipo and Roberson, I mean, this is to your point: what they where they were before at the two guard. I mean, no, this is just, listen, it's just a math I, equation not, at some point. I'm not debating that part of it. I just think that you're asking a lot of Sabonis to step in right away and give you 12 and 8 or 12 and 7 with two blocks. Like, I just don't know if that's something you can expect from a guy at this stage, you know, this young. Like, I, I don't buy that. Like, that's just not how this league works. You know, I got people on Twitter yesterday yelling and screaming that Buddy Heald's going to get 15 points a game. 15 points a game is hard to get as a rookie in this league. Like, not everybody does it. And rookies struggle. Like, that's part of the process here. And it's something I'm sure we'll get into in the next topic when yep. we get to Simmons and Ingram. But yeah, I, I just, I don't like it for either side. I don't even think Orlando got, I mean, they got marginally better, I, I think. And, and look, if Presti did this for the long term because he thinks both guys will be gone eventually, then they'll be in a better situation than, let's say, Cleveland when LeBron left, right? They're not going to be a doormat necessarily. They'll be in, in a better position in that situation. But And yeah. just to be clear, to the point I'm making, they'd right. be in a better situation than if they just had a box. Sure. Oh, yeah, I yes. get that, too. I, I, I don't dispute that because, first of all, they're under contract. They're younger. I mean, that makes more sense. But, again, that's that's more of a future outlook as opposed to the current day. And, again, Kevin Durant wants to win now. So I, I just don't understand it from that perspective because he's made it pretty clear that he's 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 looking for a championship. All right, let's continue the conversation about last night, and we talk about those rookies. As expected, the 76ers took LSU's Ben Simmons with the number one pick. Simmons is the fourth number one pick to play in college and not play in the NCAA tournament in the common draft era. The first since Michael Thompson, of course, Clay Thompson's father. That was back in 1978. Anita, I want to start with you. Is Simmons a franchise player? Uh, hopefully he is. I mean, he went number one overall. But, Better be. Uh, exactly. Right. I mean, you know, everything you hear about this young man is, is really spectacular. His court vision. Um, his, his ability to pass, how he makes other players around him better. Everything on the court you hear is phenomenal. Also, you hear the comparison of LeBron James, which I, I know I, I can't, I know we, we compared LeBron James to Michael Jordan. Now we're comparing Simmons to LeBron James. But what, is make, what, what makes LeBron James so great? He's a leader of men, right? He talks about it a lot. I, I, I get the comparison in regard to Simmons' ability to pass the ball. But what, in my opinion, what makes LeBron so great is that he takes men and he helps them become champions and the biggest knock on Simmons is that it's not part of his repertoire uh, with LSU he went 19 and 14 he's he's great on the court his his talent speaks on the court but he needs to develop into a pros pro he needs to develop into more of a vocal leader I feel for you to be a franchise player to be the That's alpha guy. male of a franchise you need to do that so I really, I think the onus is, is on the, the, the 76ers. How do they mold him? How do they help him? How do they create that? How do they get him to that level? What veteran players are going to come in or what veteran coaches are going to come in and help him get to that level? Because to become a franchise player, that's what you need to have. One of the biggest problems the Sixers had last year was basically it was all these young guys, right? Like there was nobody in there to quote unquote police the locker room. They eventually brought in Elton Brand. Um, after Jalil Okafor had his incident and whatnot. But I think that, that you're right. Like, they need a veteran presence in there. Guys need to learn how to play the game. Dwayne Wade is a guy I covered for a very long time. He talks about when he was a rookie, he had guys like Brian Grant and Eddie Jones, guys who were all-stars, guys who had been through all the different you know battles in the NBA and taught him how to be a professional. Alonzo Mourning, a lot of those type of guys. 
So I, I do think that every franchise player, every young franchise player needs that. And you need to grow into that role. Because even LeBron, we forget, mm -hmm. he didn't make the playoffs the first two yep. years. He was just a kid. Even though he was putting up good numbers, he was just a kid. Paul Silas was his coach, and they had to kind of grow him into that role. Then he started to be a little bit more of a leader, a little more assertive. Remember, we were, I mean, at times, I remember people were mocking him for his leadership ability because they said he's too chummy with his teammates or whatnot. They were taking the pictures or whatnot in pregame. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that that's the type of stuff that you have to grow into, clearly. But I do think your surroundings matter. And I think why in Philadelphia it'll work is Brett Brown. Brett Brown coached his father. Yep. Brett Brown has a relationship with this kid. Nobody in this draft knew Ben Simmons better than the Philadelphia 76ers because of Brett Brown. So that, to me, is as important as anything. Um, I also think in this league, you need playmakers. Playmakers are what make this, this thing go. And he's a, definitely a playmaker. He can move the ball as well as anybody. He's got great handle. He's big. He's strong. He can play that point forward position. And again, he's going to be the best thing for guys like Jalil Okafor, who struggled at times. Guys like Joel Embiid, if he can ever get on the floor. Nerlens Noel. He's going to make the game for those big guys easier because of his passing ability. It's phenomenal. It's as good as LeBron or a Magic Johnson at that age. Is Ben Simmons a franchise player? Let me tell you what Ben Simmons is not. He's not the next LeBron James. And we need to stop with absurd comparisons. A kid who's never played a single NBA game. I'm with you. To, I know, I know you, th that you are. But make it, there are those making these comparisons, these comparables to a top five all-timer. That's absurd. What can you hope for Ben Simmons? Is he a franchise player? I don't know. Let me ask you this. Is Draymond Green a franchise player? Is he a 1A? He's a 2. Do you build around Draymond Green? Your answer to me just now is no. No, I think he's a two. That's a much more fair comparison for Ben Simmons. A versatile Swiss Army Knife type player. Yes, bigger, 6'10". Doesn't shoot as well as Draymond. But a guy that can be anywhere on the court facilitating, making you better on offense and defense. That would be a nice, nice position for Ben Simmons to fall into. So then that asks the question again. Does that mean he's a franchise player? To me, I, I think the answer is I don't know. I don't know that he's any more of a franchise player than Jalil Okafor or Nerlens Noel. Look. Okafor, one year in the league, 17 and 7. 17.7 7 rebounds. Two years in the league for Noel. Last year he was 11 and 8. Young guys we're talking here. Very young guys. Is he, is he the guy you build around? Tom Penn said last night that Simmons is the guy. That every move from now on that the Sixers make is predicated on how this helps Ben Simmons. And I just don't know yet that that is the guy. Even the guy on that roster that demands that deference. Let me ask you this. If he had a better shot, because this is another negative that we, we heard if he did watch... The unsexy, we talked about in, in, in our pre-show meeting, how the NBA draft is unsexy. We're a little perplexed by that. But if you did watch, if he was to develop a better shot, that's another negative on him. It's a huge if. It's you. Yeah, but listen, we saw it with Jordan. We, see it, we saw it with LeBron James, right? I mean, some guys, some of the top guys that are franchise players or have been franchise players have had to do that, develop a shot. Again, that's why I said the onus really for me is on the Philadelphia 76ers, how they mature him and also how who comes in and helps him develop that shot. If he had that coming out of college and he was just lights out, let's say he had a great percentage, um, would, you, would you feel differently? Well, yeah, but if pigs had wings, they could fly. <laughs> They'd fly. So, I mean, he, he doesn't have that shot. Hand me some Red Bull. Well, it. We, we don't know if he does or doesn't. How about this? Because he only attempted, I think it was three three-point shots all season, right? Is that, wait, okay, but wait a second. Wait, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. So, if I asked you how many three-point shots Grant Hill took in his Duke career, in his first season at Duke, would you, would you know? Because I'll tell you it's two. And I think that that's a pretty good comp for him. Now, Grant Hill, obviously the ankle injury derailed his career as far as being one of the best players in the history of the game. But he was trending in that direction. He was going to be an all-timer type. And it still had a great career, don't get me wrong. But I think that's the way you look at it. It's, what did the coach ask of him? Did the coach ask him to develop a shot? Carl Anthony Towns, okay, has a better shot than Ben Simmons. I'm not debating you on that part of it. But Carl Anthony Towns... Everyone told me, man, you should have seen that kid in high school shooting threes. He can shoot the lights out. And John Calipari didn't have him do that. John Calipari told Carl Anthony Towns, I want you to play closer to the basket because I know you can shoot. And the NBA scouts need to see that you're tough enough to play close to the basket. So who knows? Maybe his coach at LSU wanted him to play that way. The argument isn't that Ben Simmons is already a bust. And the argument isn't that Ben Simmons is for sure not a franchise player. 
The argument is this. I'm not sure he's the guy oh, you around. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Exactly. Just like we don't know if he's going to build that shot that but, we all hope but, he does. But he's got a skill set. So he's look. got a skill set that a lot of other guys don't. I mean, at 6'10", I mean, we're talking about Lamar Odom, Giannis Antetokounmpo. I mean, those are the type of guys you're looking at at that size that can handle the ball that way, that can pass the ball that way, that can rebound that way, he and make plays for other guys. Jalil Okafor and Nerlens Noel will never be franchise players at number one because they're limited. Is Brandon Ingram? That's the question. I don't know. He's too scrawny, man. Yeah. Look, Brandon Ingram. Brandon Ingram. Here, real quick on Brandon Ingram. Brandon Ingram, and we talked about this on Wednesday. Brandon Ingram had one of the, look, great shot, 41% from three. But highest isolation efficiency since Kevin Durant in college. That sounds great, except he weighs 185 pounds soaking wet. Okay? And doing that in the NBA is going to be a lot more difficult than it was at Duke. We're going to get into Brandon Ingram, but I want to say this. The Philadelphia 76ers franchise cornerstone, their franchise guy, is gone. Their franchise guy was Sam Hinkie. He's the one, he's the reason that they have Ben Simmons on their roster. He's Agreed. the reason they have Okafor. He's Agreed. the reason that they have Embiid. He's the reason that they have Noel. He is the reason they have all of these options to find a franchise player, mm -hmm. which they have three possible options as a franchise player. So many NBA franchises are in a cul-de-sac. They're stuck. The New Jersey Nets have, or Brooklyn Nets, excuse me, have no idea. It's going to be a little hard. Yeah, listen, I, does it, I do worry, it all the time. I get it. Don't worry and about we it. live there. Yep. The Nets. Relicans still throw me off. It's, you, you, so many franchises find themselves where they have no idea how to get out of the situation they're in. How are they going to build forward? And the 76 today have several potential answers to that. And the reason why is Sam Hinkie. He will be the genius that is only recognized after his time is over. Somebody so, else. So will he get a ring? When, he will get if, no ring. If no. then? The if Colangelo's then, will take credit for will, this. Will he so get a ring? Will, <laughs> the the, the backstabbing knife fight for the credit that he deserves is on now. But the truth is, he deserves the credit. Hashtag trust the process. The Lakers took Duke's Brandon Ingram with the number two pick. Ingram has the highest chance to become an all-star in his first five seasons, according to ESPN Analytics draft projection. Will? I am. What does this mean for the Lake Show? We don't like when. Yeah, call like me Miss. No, Miss Thang. Ma'am, Miss. No. You're gonna have to change the entire culture then. I know. It's it's being polite. Where you, I, Alabama. Where are you from? Texas. 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 Good morning, um, What does this mean for the Lake Show? It means they have a piece, mm -hmm. a very important piece, possibly a 1A. This player, in my mind, has a real chance to be a 1A, a guy you can build around. And if that's the case. It's the first guy on that roster that can be the franchise cornerstone. And that's a big step forward for the Lakers. Because I have to tell you, they're much closer to that cul-de-sac I mentioned a moment ago than, say, the 76ers. They're in a position where, outside of their free agent prospects, you have to ask yourself, how are we going to move forward? How are we going to build? Because I don't think the answer is D'Angelo Russell. I think Julius Randle is a nice piece. Not a 1A, a 3, not even. third player, not even a third player on on your pecking order, on your totem pole, um, but Brandon Ingram is. Brandon Ingram, a guy that shot 41% from three. A guy, and this just, George, so well fits what the modern NBA needs to be. Shot 40% of his shots behind the arc and 40% of his shots in the paint. Don't mess around in the middle ground. Don't mess around with mid-range jumpers, the worst shot in the NBA to take. The lowest percentage shot, by the way, I saw last night. Ingram shot 41% from three. That's 62% from two. Because three is worth more than two. It's just like, really <laughs> Simmons. True shooting percentage. Look yeah, at you, yeah. Mr. Analytics. Look, Simmons shot eighty-four percent of his shots in the paint. Yeah. What was his shooting percentage? Was it over sixty-two percent? No. This guy. This guy puts in the basket, no matter where he is on the court, and he's in the right spots on the court. I like this player. This is the kind of thing that can move the Lakers forward. And as opposed to yesterday, they now have a direction. They can acquire a free agent. They can entice somebody. D'Angelo Russell is a net negative on that, not a net positive, a guy that has done some things to really, really sell out teammates. By the way, just for the record, cutting a commercial, making fun of your biggest mistake, making money off one of your biggest mistakes, bad move. You're not making fun of yourself. You're exacerbating what you did. Talking to about Nick the Iggy Young. and Nick Young. Yep. Yeah, I'm See, about I, his, I disagree with you. I'm talking about this commercial we took. Yeah, where he took um, his phone. Took, he, yeah, he Simmons' threw, phone throws out the, the window. window. No, I, that's not self-deprecating. I like that's it. That's exacerbating. You need to do your best to help forget this situation and hope everyone else will. Nobody, anyway, but nobody's gonna forget it. Nobody's gonna forget it. I, they just, about they it? just recently broke up, and the first thing I, I thought I know, of it was Game Seven when that all broke on social media. The first thing I thought of was, "Wow, it was D'Angelo Russell." I, I mean, is this a fallout from that? I don't, I don't think anybody's gonna forget about it. I kind of like that he kind of made light of the situation. I, I mean, you know, listen, it's 
let's move on. But it was funny. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I think that's self-deprecating. And I think that usually that's the best way to get over on people. And But back to Ingram, though. I do you, don't, you don't want to sit in there for... <laughs> Self-deprecating is like making fun of yourself when it's at no one's else's expense. Like, it's like pointing out you can't grow hair in the middle of your mustache. Like No one else suffers from that joke but me. This one actually suffers. Thanks for pointing well, that out. No, no, no one suffers from the entire no, show. You really can't grow yeah. up there? If I wanted to grow a Hitler mustache, I could. <laughs> Let's not forget wow. Nick Bad Young. example. Nick Young is yeah. also... Yeah, Michael Jordan went for it. I just can't do it. Let's not forget Nick Young is also culpable here. Okay, let, like, let's not That's just... The whole point. For, You're taking him down with you on this. I, I get it, but none of this would have happened if he wouldn't have done what he did to begin with. Like, let's start there, okay? So like, that's why I don't have as big a deal with the commercial. Um, but to Ingram, I, listen, I'm with you. I think the kid's going to be really good. I just have to see him put on some weight yes. first. That's it. Like, he has he, put on a lot already. Right, he has. I, I know. I talked to him the other day on radio, and he was talking to me about he, he hates... from one, 169 to 172? What, yeah. what, like, no. No, he went up to like no. 185, 190 yeah. almost. Yeah. yeah. Like, he's I'm put on kidding. 20 pounds. I'm kidding. But he told me he hates, you know, he, he told me he hates the smoothies. He hates all the stuff, the protein shakes he's doing, but he's going to have to put on more. Yep. Uh, because, you know, we talked about this a little bit on Wednesday. I don't like the outlier comparisons. Everyone's like, oh, he's the next Kevin Durant. Slow down, just like you said Slow with Ben role. Simmons. Slow down a little bit because there's not a lot of examples of a guy as real thin as Kevin Durant when he came in the league mm -hmm. being that successful. So I'd like to see him put on some weight, and I think he will. Look, he's a young kid. He's going to put on weight. That's going to be the reality of this. I do think he can be a guy that you can count on moving forward because he's got that discernible skill of shooting, and that's important in this league. He can get to the basket. Um, I just think he's going to have a problem early in his career getting to the basket because he's too light. But once he puts on the weight, I think he's going to be a, an all-star caliber player. I'm with you. Keep in mind, the Lakers last year, last in field goal percentage from jump shots, last in three-point shooting. Yeah, because Byron, Byron Scott hated three-point shooting in a league that everybody's shooting three. No oh. wonder he doesn't have a job. Okay, he probably <laughs> agrees with Phil Jackson in regards to the Golden State Warriors. But in, in, I, I can't believe you guys haven't mentioned this yet. I mean, the fact that Luke Walton is coming from Golden State to coach the Lakers, could you have asked for a better situation for Ingram to come to the Lakers and how Luke Walton is going to totally tap into that skill set like nobody's business? I'm more excited for what Luke Walton is going to be able to do with this young man. Granted, yes, he's 18. Another thing we were talking about, Lisa Salter's talking to him after he got drafted. I loved her question after she, you know, acknowledged the fact that he was so skinny, yeah. um, was, you know, what, what can you bring to the Lakers? And he said, leadership, something that we've been mm -hmm. talking about that Simmons might not be able to bring right away to the 76ers. And the fact that Kobe's gone, and this is the first season, really no Kobe there, besides the, the, his, his in, incredible shot, this is what the Lakers need is that leadership. And he knows it at 18 for him to say that coming off the stage was really impressive to me. And again, I'm probably more excited to see what Luke Walton's going to be able to do with his skill set and the offense that he's going to create around him probably more than anything else. No, that's a good point. But look, he did also say in that interview that he wasn't the most vocal leader of Duke. So he's going to have to kind of grow into that role. And I think much like when we talked about the 76ers, the Lakers are going to need to put veteran guys around those guys too to kind of Develop. Police the locker room, show them the way, show them how to be pros, because you need that. Every superstar in this league talks about a veteran, and that doesn't have to be a superstar veteran, just a veteran, a guy who you know brings his you know, lunch pail to work every day and, and knows how to play the game and doesn't get into any issues off the court. That's the type of guy you need. Now, on to basketball reasons with Luke Walton, it's why I think D'Angelo Russell will play better next season because of that system. That system relies heavy on the point guard. So D'Angelo Russell is still a guy that can get his shot off pretty much whenever he wants. He's a pretty good shooter. I think that we'll see some growth with him, too, on the court, and I think a lot of that is Luke Walton. But I think those guys will help each other. I think that he's going to have to get Ingram involved, too, because Ingram had 83s this past season. 76 of those were on catch-and-shoot threes. So that means the point guard's going to have to get him the ball. Too often, I think... We try to build off the last champion. We think every single moment in every sport is a reinvention of how the game is played. When the truth is, the best teams figure out what's the talent on my roster and what's the best way to utilize that talent. Let's hope Luke Walton doesn't say, I'm going to recreate the Warriors in the South. I'm going to go to L.A. and recreate the Warriors. Because what he needs to do is look at the talent available to him and say, what's the best way for this collection of guys to play together? Basketball hasn't been reinvented. The Warriors haven't reinvented basketball. Good luck, by the way, if you think so, and you're going to try to build the next Golden State Warriors, because you're going to need the next Steph Curry. 
You're going to need a few ingredients that is unique to that team. And we just saw the Cavaliers play the way you're supposed to. Win with the talent you have, which they have obviously a, a transcendental talent in LeBron James. What Luke Walton and the Lakers need to do is see what is the best asset I have. I think, George, to your point about Brandon Ingram's isolation plays, that actually is a net plus for him. A guy that can take the ball by himself, put it in the bucket, and also stand outside and play a guy that can catch and shoot. He's got both sides of this, what I hope that means. You're right, he's skinny. Yeah. So yeah, maybe he can't. It, it'll be in two years that that'll that won't be an issue. Maybe anymore. when he isolates and goes to the hole in right. the NBA, he gets thrown ten feet out of bounds. Right. Maybe that happens. Early on, that's probably going to happen because it happens to almost everybody. But that's Luke Walton's job. And, Find and out not, what's unique about this team. And Don't I'm, make D'Angelo Russell Steph Curry because he's not. I'm I'm with you, and I think some of the best coaches, not just in the NBA but in the NFL, all over, what they do is they look at their talent and their skill set and what they have on the roster, and then they create an offense or a defense, whatever the case may be, around what they have. But look what, and, and I'm going to use the, the example of Jeff Hornacek coming to the Knicks, right? It's all about the triangle offense with Phil Jackson, but Hornacek coming there, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be tweaked a little bit. It's going to be somewhat of a hybrid. So, you know, just because Luke Walton is coming from the Golden State Warriors doesn't mean that that's the exact offense he's going to imp implement at, in, in Los Angeles. Maybe he tweaks it a little bit. Hopefully he does. George, I have a question. They struck out last year, obviously, in free agency, the Lakers. Do you think they get a good free agent this time around? It depends on what your definition of a good free agent is. I don't think they're getting Kevin Durant. So, I mean, uh, there's a bunch of Who other good Who could help them players. get closer to the playoffs? I mean, look, there's going to be guys out there. Hassan Whiteside is going to mm -hmm. be out there. DeMar DeRozan. If they, can get, if they can pair two guys and put them out there, maybe that's, that, that's the recipe. Um, I, though Hassan Whiteside is not necessarily the most mature guy all the time, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily count on him for leadership. But DeMar DeRozan's been a good player and has been a steady player in this league, so maybe he can help them. Too. Within two to three years, the Lakers will have a marquee franchise-level free agent oh, on no that question. roster. The salary cap going to $90 million next year, $120 million the next. So many guys want to be the guy that brought the Lakers back yeah, to own that town. Bold. They'll yeah. be there and, soon. And, look, be there. It's and not a shabby town to own. It's cyclical yeah. with the Lakers. They don't go very <laughs> long, okay, without getting back into the championship mix. It's, I think if you do the math, it averages about six years between championship relevancy. The way the rule is right now, okay, I'm fine with it. But I don't agree with the baseball rule. If you want them to go out of high school, let them go. That's between the Players Association and the NBA. I'm fine with that. The ones that don't go come for you. And after one year, if they're, what if a kid says, I'm coming back and you have a baseball rule, and he has to stay three years or two years, and he grows seven inches that summer, and you're making him stay in school for what reason? Let him go after a year. If he if he's, wants to go after one year, two years, let him go. Cal says let him go for the third straight year and fifth time since 08. Each of the top three picks have been a freshman. Calipari has had 10 one-and-done players that have gone top seven in the draft as head coach of Memphis and Kentucky. Will, are you on board with one-and-dones? No, and Molly, I was sitting right off set the other day mm -hmm. when Coach Cal was right here saying that. So badly wanted to come over here you and debate him out? on this point. Yeah. He said he's fine with it. He's fine with one and done. Well, I'm sure that he is because it helps him out quite greatly. He gets these guys to come in. They stick around for one year, boost his program. He does incredibly well with them, and then they're gone. And he bolstered his argument by arguing it against requiring them to stay three years. That's not the criticism of the one and done, not in my book. The criticism is this. There should be no rule in place. The one-and-done requirement that a young guy go to college or spend some one year somewhere else before going to the NBA is one of the most unjust, unfair, un-American concepts, not just in sports, but in modern American economy. You take a group of very special, uniquely talented individuals, human beings who are so different from the rest of us, and you tell them two things. Number one, you tell them you can't go make a living, not here in the United States on this, or at least not at the highest levels. You cannot go capitalize on your special talents. And then, as a byproduct, because they're buddies with the NCAA, they create this little cartel where it's not just you can't come over here and make money, you need to go over here and give away these special talents of yours for free. You need to risk injury, risk your career. The comparisons to this are ugly. Telling people you have to work for free, telling people your unique talents must be given away to someone else, very, very, very ugly. I just want you to think about this. Michael Dell dropped out of the University of Texas. Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of Harvard. Mm -hmm. They started Dell Computers and Facebook. 
What if we had a rule that said, no, 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 you can't. You've got to stick around for some X number of arbitrary years before you can go make money. Not only would that be unjust to them, it would be unjust to us. We'd have no we wouldn't have either. Facebook. We wouldn't have Dell Computers. Or at least we wouldn't have had to wait more years well, for them. And we don't get, by the way, if you, you guys all love Ben Simmons? If Ben Simmons is that great, we lost a year of Ben Simmons. We lose a year of special talent from special people because of this unjust un-American rule. So many things I want to say here. You're talking about one year, and you can't compare, uh, you know, a, a, a man who goes and, and starts a multi-billion dollar company to a professional athlete. Why? Because it's, it's night and day. The worlds, the universes that they live in are totally different. I, I mean, and, and I think there is an advantage for a player who's 18 years old who goes to college. And, and Cal, again, I, I watched the episode. You were standing there. I was at home on my couch watching. I, I am a viewer mm -hmm. frequently. I think you do a great job. Thanks. And, um, and what I love that he talked about, and Towns was here as well, and he talked about was the fathership role. And it's not just Cal. It's Coach K. It's a lot of these coaches that play. You've got a lot of young men who come from homes. They don't have fathers. Okay? They're, they, they don't, their upbringing isn't the best. They come to college. And it is a responsibility of a head coach to become somewhat of a father figure for these guys to help them kind of bridge that connection from college to the pros. And they helped him. You heard Towns talk about it. I mean, heck, he, and, and then I, 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 I believe Cal was on Mike and Mike, and he had other players that he had coached that are now in the NBA who still, they remain in contact with him. He's like a father figure. I think that's so important, especially this day and age, to have an 18, 17, 18-year-old go to the NBA, that lifestyle, where we are with social media, I just, I think it would be a complete mess. I understand that you're saying it's not American, but I think it's, I think it's an advantage. I think it's worthwhile. I think it's a smart move for a young player to at least spend a year in college that is going to have that kind of, that, that upbringing from that head coach. Anita, I would say this, and look, I'm sure there's a lot of players that, as you mentioned, a number of them that have great relationships with their coaches and Calipari in this case as well. Uh, but I don't like the whole fathership role thing because let's take a look at Calipari. Scalabasia yesterday, right? That kid wasn't ready to go into the NBA draft. He dropped like a rock yesterday. He was the number two high school player in the country. Couldn't even get on the court at Kentucky basically this past season. And he basically pushed him out because, you know what, I got seven more freshmen coming in this season, so you're not going to be able to play because i got to play those guys. So I don't know how much of a father figure he really is to everybody. To the successful ones, we always hear those stories, but we don't hear about what happened to this poor kid Well, the yesterday. successful ones are the ones that we're talking about that have the ability right, but to what make about the jump the from high school to What about the Scalabassiers who got pushed out of the door in Kentucky, basically, because there's going to be a guy taking his spot next season? So that the, I just think the father role That's stuff gets overplayed. Yeah, I don't. That gets overplayed. I don't, especially watching watching him kind of do the car wash here. And, and on every show he was on, how players were calling in and, 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 and talking about it. And this is very odd for me because I'm completely on Will's side. This doesn't happen very often <laughs> oh, here. Oh, wow. So it, I'm the loner here. I, I, I do agree that there is a correlation between a Mark Zuckerberg and a LeBron James coming out of high school or whatever, or these athletes, because they're brands. And LeBron James a brand from the minute he came out, what did he get, a $90 million deal from Nike as a high school player? So, yeah, they are absolutely brands. So there's a correlation there. But you uh, can still build your brand in college. For and free. And, 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 right, for free. And in essence, college players, and I know this, people hate when I say this, I've said it on the radio, too. they are, in essence, indentured servants. Like, that's what this is. That's a nice way of saying it. Too. Okay. They are indentured servants. They get nothing. And I don't give me the education because you know what? The $35,000 a year at a private school that it costs to go to college isn't worth, isn't equal to what they're putting out. At least the guys playing Division One basketball or Division One football. Guys, so, we're then, talking about one year. I understand if we're talking about three years, which Cal alluded to, but we're talking about one year. And I think when you look, but, when you, when you weigh the, the pros and the cons in regard to all that can go bad, for again, a 17 on the verge of 18 year old player. Come on, look. Here's you, we, we, we've, we've, we've been covering sports for a long time. You and I go way back to, to the MIA. We've been covering sports for a long time. That atmosphere, that lifestyle, unless a team hires somebody to come in and help mentor a young kid, it's but too much. Here's the thing, Anita. I'm not arguing that every high schooler should go into the NBA. Right. I'm not arguing that it's the right decision for everybody. I'm arguing that it's not up to me. I think it's patronizing. One year is short to you. 
Maybe it wasn't to LeBron James. Maybe one year wasn't short to Ben Simmons. It's not my decision. It's not the NCAA's decision. It's the Simmons family. It's Ben Simmons. It's his career. It's his path. It's those people that should get to make the decision. There's a difference between won't and can't, right? You, if you choose not to go to the NBA, bravo. If a team chooses not to draft you, bravo. But if a team can't, and if you can't, that's different. You write about the fatherhood role. Maybe that's the right decision in some cases with some coaches. I think you write about the hypocrisy on it as well. But the point is I'm not going to go into every single individual decision. It'll be right for some guys. It'll be wrong for others. But I trust them. There will be mistakes. But I trust them on large to make it. And I don't I have think it's choice. my job to tell who people what they can and can't do. Well, and let's look at this from a big picture standpoint, okay? LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Kevin Garnett. We can go on and on and on. There's a, there were a lot of guys that became the stars of the league that came straight out of high school. Were there a few guys who didn't make it? Sure. But there are a few one and dones that don't make it either. So I, I just don't understand the logic behind it. And a lot of these guys, in, in, in some of these cases, I mean, how much schooling are they actually getting? Like, how many classes are they actually? We going know the to? answer with Ben Simmons. Right. None. You see what <laughs> I'm saying? So there's a lot of that too. So you yeah, know what? They're, Let they're these in... guys go make money. Why did? Why does Brandon Jennings and Emmanuel Moutier and maybe some other kids who are thinking about it have to go overseas to make that money? It doesn't make any sense. But there is. You look like I, I don't know about your college experience, but I learned so much in college, not just in the classroom. It was right for you. Of course. Yeah. It was it, right for it was, you. And it's I, not and right I for think, everybody. And I think it's right for a number of people. And I'll go one step further. I, I mean, you know, I would love to take a poll in regard to, like, sports moms and dads out there. And what would they like to see their child do at 15, 17, going into 18? Would they like to see them immediately make that jump into a professional NBA organization? And again, gentlemen, I will go back to that lifestyle. Yeah, it is, you're not it wrong, is, and that's the is, point. You're not wrong about the lifestyle. You're not wrong that some families will look at that and go, not right for my kid. You can be right about all of this. You're just saying and still be they wrong about have, your they have the choice. You're saying they just should have, have the choice. They it doesn't mean they the should choice. use That's it. it. But yeah. they have the freedom. Have to There's a lot of things I like, but that doesn't mean I impose them or take them away from other people. I really like the University of Texas. I love that Jarrett Allen, a young stud, number 15 high school basketball recruit in the country, is going to UT next year. It helps me, but he shouldn't have to. He shouldn't have to spend a year with the Longhorns. I'm really happy he's going to be there, <laughs> but I shouldn't impose that upon him. I'm Ian Fitzsimmons on the latest edition of Football Today. Dan Graziano lets you know how one particular rookie might have a huge impact in the New York Giants contending in the NFC East. And we have another example of why you should be aware of the billionaire owner. Subscribe on the Listen tab of the ESPN app. Add the Knicks to the list of teams that are ready to make a run at KD. According to a report by the New York Daily News and confirmed by ESPN, Knicks president Phil Jackson told newly acquired Derrick Rose that he is going after Kevin Durant. The Knicks roster has some holes to say the least, but they do now have Rose to join Carmelo Anthony in Kristaps Porzingis. You can see the roster there. George, if Durant leaves OKC, should he go to the Garden? I guess it's the Rose Garden now. Why are you laughing? Oh, because I just think the whole thing is pretty ridiculous. But I would say not just no. How about hell no? Why? Wow. What was the last time Derrick Rose was good? When was the last time he shot 45% from the Before field? Before he tore his ACL three yeah. times? Yeah, 45%. That's, that's about average for a guard. When was the last time he did that? Last two months of this past season? 2011. After March of this year, he shot 50%. I'm talking about for a season. Oh, okay. I mean, Derrick Rose has played well in <laughs> spurts. All the details get in the way of Derrick Rose has played well in spurts, sure, plenty of times. But there's an injury history. There's a guy who wasn't very efficient even when he won the MVP. We could talk about that that year in 2011. You could have given it to LeBron. You probably could have given it to Dwight Howard. He got it. That's fine. But he's not the player he once was. So you're going to tell me you're selling Kevin Durant on Derrick Rose... On a bum leg still, probably, who's not very efficient, who's not really known as a distributor. And Carmelo Anthony, who's also a guy who likes to have the ball in his hands. You're going to sell him on that? Like, who's going to get him the ball? Like, they're basically going to fight each other just for the basketball. There's only one of them on the floor. And then what are you going to do with Porzingis? So there's no way. I know he thinks Porzingis is great, called him a unicorn. I get all that. But... Come on, man. Like, Carmelo Anthony and Derrick Rose are on the decline at this stage. He's going to latch on to those guys? That makes zero sense. Yeah, but what I find very interesting is, you know, all the talk and speculation of the big-name guys in free agency that can come and play in New York City. They say that every year, and though. And play at the Garden. That's well, New York arrogance. But Stop it with that. We've been hearing that for 20 years. This is, this is where I'm going with this, George, and that is 
even with the addition of Phil Jackson, it didn't make it different. Even with them drafting Porzingis and him arguably being the, the second best rookie last year, that didn't do it. Melo doesn't do it. But apparently, with D. Rose now in New York, there's some phone calls being made. There's some intrigue. This might be how you feel, and I agree with you in regard to what can he, how is he going to make the Knicks better. What I like about it is that him coming to the Knicks, there's less pressure for him in New York. To me, you can argue, is he the two? No, I actually think he's the three. I think he's behind Melo. I think he's behind Porzingis. I think the pressure is less, but the name and his respect in the league is getting intrigue for the big-name players to come there. Now, another thing. With... All that's gone on and, and, and um, Rodin Lopez going, and it's opened up some free agency cash. Hypothetically speaking, Kevin Durant can come to New York, and in 2017, oh, hello, come on over, Westbrook. Now what happens? Now you've got a team that I think really, truly can compete in the East and give the Cavs a run for their money to try to make it to uh, the postseason. But I'm, I'm with you. I agree with you. What do you get with Rose? Uh, I, I mean, but I like the fact that... To me, he's a three on this roster, and his name is it's, it's making guys, free agents around the NBA, make some phone calls and be intrigued about coming to the Big Apple. Will? You know the trouble with your analysis, George? That it's sound? That it's caught up in the deep end. <laughs> oh, thanks. Mm. Those kind of matter. It's not that you're wrong. <laughs> that you're lost in the forest for the trees. Yeah, you're right. Does it work on the court with D-Rose? I don't know. That's a lot of ball handling. I mean, that's a lot of people with the ball in their hand, plus Carmelo. I mean, gosh, it's almost a nightmare, right? How does that ever work? Those are the details. Here's why. If you're Kevin Durant and taking off the table that you stay in OKC, which I've argued for two straight days, is the right decision sure. for Kevin Durant. Agreed, agreed. We all agree Taking with that. that off the table. If you leave OKC, should he consider the Knicks? And the answer is, hell yes. <laughs> you know why? They write songs about you in New York. <laughs> you know why? Because the Empire State Building. You know why? Wow. Because New York is the Rome yeah. of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. If you were going to live in Italy in like 100 AD, yeah. where'd you want to live? You want to live in Rome. Sure. New York, that's the Rome of the United States. That's coming from somebody who believes that Texas probably ought to go ahead and get its own country. <laughs> New York, oh, man. It's New York. <laughs> Listen, I love New York as much garden. as the next guy. It's but, the garden. But they haven't played great basketball in the garden in four oh, years. Oh, that's true. I mean, truthfully, <laughs> truthfully, the reason Kevin Durant shouldn't go to the Knicks is because Dolan family. That's the reason you don't go to the That's it. End of the discussion. It, it could be. But that being said, I don't... Yes, you're right, Nia. That they will have, I think it's $30 million in cap space. Oh, yeah. And D-Rose helps that out. If he doesn't work out in the next year, that's another $14 Bye. million in cap space that you have to work with. And if you don't think there's such thing as a, as a free agent lure, let me introduce you to Kevin Durant. Many guys will be happy to join Kevin Durant uh -oh. in New York. So, let, let's, so the let's, answer to this is, should he consider New York? Yes, because you know why? Legend. Let's role play here. Let's role play here for a second. Okay, if I'm Kevin Durant, Derek Rose, Steph Curry. Derek Rose, Steph Curry. Derrick Rose, Kawhi Leonard, Carmelo Anthony, Kawhi Leonard. Yeah, come on, get out of here. So like, I'm going to go to Golden State, and I'm going to be, as I've said, the remora fish to Steph Curry. I'm going to be the guy that signed on to yeah. an easy title. I'm going to be the mm -hmm. footnote right. in the Golden State story. Yeah, LeBron was supposed to, to be a footnote, too, right? I'm going to go when San Antonio. When he went to play with Dwayne Wade, he was supposed to be the footnote, and then LeBron won the two finals. I'm going to go to San Antonio, get the same treatment. Come oh, on. these guys were great before I got here. Listen. Or I go to New York. You seem I to resurrect. forget recent history. I resurrect. One of the all-time franchises. Go to the Lakers, the then. Biggest marquee market in Look, the NBA. The, the Lakers are... Listen, equation. no, it's but the, the Knicks aren't the Yankees, okay? The Yankees are that franchise in baseball. The Lakers are the Yankees in the NBA. If he wants to do that, go to the Lakers where there's a history of it, where you have Kareem, Shaq, Kobe, Magic, all those guys. The Knicks, I mean, what are we talking about? We're talking about a finals run, you know, back with Jeff Van Gundy, was the coach. I mean, how long ago was look, that look, now? The, the question wasn't, should he go to the Lakers? Should he, should he consider the Knicks? You're right. I think if he leaves OKC, and again, he should not, but if he leaves, his two choices should between, be between Los Angeles and New York. That's where legends are made. They're not even the best team in the East for him. That's the franchise he can resurrect. By the way, they're not even in the best option for him in the East. What's great about this is not only does he get to get into a marquee market, he gets to revitalize both. He's not signing up for the easy Listen, championship Will, with either if, one. If he were going to go to the East, the only he becomes a savior. The two teams he should go to in the East should be Washington, which I don't think he's going to go to. I don't think he wants to go That's back home. Town, he, he doesn't, but he's not LeBron in that sense. Like he doesn't want to do that. No, but he's he's but, close with family. Look, he, he nominated. What he gave his mom the MVP award. 
Look, look. I mean, he loves Miami family. was in the Eastern Conference semis. Okay, everybody thought Miami and, and Cleveland were going to clash. Then they got hurt. Yeah. Hassan Whiteside got hurt. That to me, if he's going to go anywhere in the East, which I don't think he should go to Miami. I think he should go to Golden State. I've made that very clear. If he leaves OKC. But Miami's a much better possibility for him to try to win a championship than the Knicks with a broken Derrick Rose and Carmelo, who's been dealing with injuries and getting older, too. That See, makes I didn't no make sense. make the argument about the best place to win a championship. But that's what he wants. He wants to win a championship I'm now. Playing. He doesn't want to wait. This is silly. But I'm legend. still, I'm still, again, I'm still banking. And how do you become a legend? By winning championships. I'm still banking on that Westbrook is going to follow Kevin. If, I'm with you. I think both of them, they were one game away from representing the West in the championship. And, and again, I will say, I think they would have had a better shot of beating the Cavs. That's number one. Number two, Westbrook, you think Durant loves Przingis? Westbrook loves him even ten times. Westbrook's if he leaves so, OKC, Westbrook's going to LA. He's going I, to Lakers. See, I don't, I don't. I, either they both stay, home. they either both stay in OKC, or I think Westbrook will follow him. Here's my question. I think the Lakers have a better shot of getting both of them in 2017 than anyone else if they were going to go together somewhere. Let's pretend the Knicks stay fairly similar in terms of the roster, and they do get KD. How far can they go? Oh, I mean, they're. What, I still don't think they're better. Second than the, round of the yeah, playoffs. Yeah, I don't think they're better than the Cavs. I don't think that, and, and, but that's another thing. We've been talking about East West, East oh, West. I don't it's think it's got to be very tempting for a player like to Kevin Durant East. to be in the East because you have a better opportunity to at least make it. The, the only team in the East, East that he gives that he gives the Cavs a run for their money is Miami. That's it. Actually, Ke Kevin Durant joins the Knicks. They're in the Eastern Conference Finals, right there. They're okay. better in Toronto. And, and don't, think, and don't, look, on the don't think they're done the right now. They're not done right now. I still, th I still think there is money to be spent. There are moves that still Phil Jackson is going to make. And I will go back to Jeff Hornacek. Let me tell you something. The buzz, guys are excited to play for this guy. We talked about, again, Phil Jackson, Mello, the fact that it's New York City, not, not t tantalizing enough to come there. Well, bringing in Derrick Rose, bringing in Jeff Hornacek, I think that has been yeah. the difference maker. I think that, I think this roster is going to get even better than just Derrick Rose. Kevin Durant wants a championship. He's going to have to go to a team with a championship culture. The Knicks are not that. No surprise to anybody. Ben Simmons and Brandon Ingram were the top two picks in the draft. After those guys, eight international players were taken in the first round, which ties the most international players selected in the first round. There were also 11 draft day trades, including the blockbuster deal between the Magic and the Thunder. Anita, let's start with you. What was your biggest takeaway from last night's draft? I mean, you said it. It has to be the international players. Um, I, I, I watched the first portion of the draft from home and, and you know, rattling off the names. I was, who? Mm -hmm. What? What? Who? Where? Who's he? I, it was just, it was unbelievable to me. And just to share some stats with you, 14 in the first 30, 26 overall, two from Croatia, two from France. And how about this? The 76ers, they've got six players on their roster from across the pond. Pretty interesting. Everybody looking for that next, like, Yao Ming, that, that next Dirk Nowitzki. And, and, of course, listen, let's go back to what happened with Porzingis last year. You know, the Knicks draft him. He gets booed. And now he's, I talked about it earlier, I mean, he's the second best NBA rookie coming out of last year. And everybody wants his, his jersey. You walk around the streets of New York, right, Will? And everybody's wearing a Porzingis. Everybody loves him. There's a lot of excitement. We're talking about how Kevin Durant and Westbrook love him. I mean, and why is that, though? Because we don't know a lot about mm -hmm. these international players. But obviously the teams do. They go out, they draft them, they bring them in. And I think it's really going to be exciting to see how they develop and who might be those new names that are going to become household names. I, I think it's kind of cool. Let me piggyback off your point. 16 of 30 players taken in the first round were not born in the U.S. That's the lowest since 1973. It's incredible. Go ahead, Will. You can go. Uh, my biggest takeaway from the draft is what a, um overrated exercise it is. It is completely, at this point, it's almost worthless. Um, don't just take it from me. Take it from the way the NBA franchises are valuing their draft picks. They're simply not, and it's an amazing turnaround because 36 months ago, when the salary cap was tighter, everybody wanted to get in the position to have a first round pick. They needed somebody cheap, talented, hopefully talented, on their roster. And today, look at the Boston Celtics. How many picks did they have yesterday? I mean, oh, man. six? Eight, I believe. Yeah. Eight picks, starting with the number three pick, which they desperately tried try to trade out of. And they simply couldn't because nobody wants these guys. Nobody wants to project where the number three pick in the 2016 draft is going to go. At this point, with the salary cap going to 90 million this year and 120 million next year or the years that follow, 
What you can do is you can afford knowledge. You can afford experience. You can afford proven commodities. That's what people want now. Look at the failed deals. Nerland's Noel, uh, Covington, and random assortment of 20-something picks offered by Philadelphia for the number three pick. We don't know who backed out of that deal, but Boston thought they could do better, and they didn't. Jimmy Butler for the number five pick didn't come together because ultimately, I, get, I would imagine Chicago looks at it and goes, Chris Dunn versus Jimmy Butler, I mean, number five pick? No, not doing that deal. What these guys are worth, just simply in a market equation today, isn't what it was two years ago, definitely isn't what it was, what it was ten years ago. It's just not the way teams build their franchises anymore. They just do not care anymore to build around these draft picks. Ultimately, I agree with your overall premise. I, I do. Uh, especially when you compare it, let's say, to the NFL, right? The NFL, you know, the top, you expect the top two or three, four picks in your draft to stick, at least on your squad, for at least a season or two. Uh, that's not the case in the NBA, but I think it's just the pool is smaller. You only have 15 roster spots, so many guaranteed contracts. There's only so much you can do in that situation. But I, I would, I, I think, you're going a little overboard with the useless or worthless, I believe is the word you used, only because of this. And look, man, I covered a guy for 13 years in Pat Riley who thinks exactly like you think. He thinks of young players as assets. He wants proven commodities. That's Pat Riley. Okay, That's who he is. That's the way he does business. It's why the Heat always go for the big splash in free agency. That's the way he handles himself. But... That works for certain destinations. It works for a place like Miami. It works for Los Angeles. It works for New York, right? In, in theory. It doesn't work for everybody, though. If you're a small market team in the NBA, the San Antonios of the world, which, look, LaMarcus Aldridge was an outlier. That, that isn't what they normally do. Look at the way they built their championships. Ginobili, Duncan, Parker. They did that through the draft. The Oklahoma City Thunder, Westbrook and Duran Ibaka, they were built through the draft. These small market teams need the draft still. Now, overall, I I'm with you because there's just not enough guys stick. Hell, there's probably half the guys in the lottery who don't stick very long. Right. So I, I get what you're saying overall. I just don't think it's completely worthless. I think it's a bigger picture discussion that needs to happen because what ends up happening, to your point with the international players, is that because there's not a real minor league system, and I know the D League is getting better, but not every team has an affiliate yet. I think that they have to stash some of these guys in Europe, and I think they still need to work that part of it out. But I don't think it's worthless, but I don't necessarily I, think it's it's. I, I don't think it's the NFL. Let's leave. Can I just it say this, Anita. I mean, I think that your examples actually help prove my point. Oklahoma City and San Antonio found Kevin Durant and Tim Duncan. I wouldn't argue you can't on occasion, maybe once every three, four years, find a franchise-building talent. LeBron came through the draft. Yeah, but even their, even their role players, like but, but, Steven Adams was a, was a low lottery pick. I mean, Tony Parker was the 29th pick in the draft. Manu Ginobili, the 56th pick the, in the draft. And these are the exceptions. I get it, but these some teams know how to do this. Like, no. San Antonio does a really good job at the draft. Oklahoma City, Sam Presti, who learned at the foot of Greg Popovich and R.C. Buford, is really good at the draft. Some guys are good at the Golden State Warriors. Bob Myers, he's good at the draft. But who went first in that draft with Kevin Durant? Kevin Durant went third, right? Greg, second. Greg Oden went first. Okay. Okay, so right. so it, it really it's it's kind of a crapshoot in some way, and also it's 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 somewhat luck in regard to these players panning out. And I want to go back. But to every draft is like that. The NFL first but, rounders, fifty percent don't make don't don't but, have a long career. Look at the, the Patriots. And but I think yeah. NFL very different in regard to free agency and, and the NBA, which I find really intriguing because. And let's take the Giants for example. Giants went out this year and spent a ton of money, especially on the defensive side of the ball. They bring in Snacks, Olivier Vernon, all these guys. Now the biggest knock or concern in regards to the NFL and spending this money like we've seen the Washington Redskins right do on time and time again is wow once these guys get their contract they get their payday then their production declines mm -hmm. so why is it will that in the NBA it's not the case you're sitting here saying that NBA, t NBA teams will do better spending that money in free agency and getting these free agent players because it's more of a crapshoot when it comes to drafting in the NBA than it is drafting in the NFL so why is I mean, it so different when really the risk is more so in the NFL with free agent players and not so much with drafted players? Yeah, I mean, I think we've learned clearly in the NFL the way to build your franchise is through the draft. Exactly. But what we've also learned in the NBA, the way to build your franchise, at least through recent history, is through free agency. And the reason, ultimately, the answer to your question is look at the GMs. That's my argument. Look how they value draft picks. If you watched the draft last night, the Danny Ainge went into last night thinking he had a full house mm -hmm. or possibly a, a four of a kind. He thought he was sitting at the table in the power position. And he came out of that draft with Jalen Brown, 
who's a nice player. He's going to be a nice player. With Jalen Brown. He's going to be a nice player. And some international guys whose names I can't pronounce. <laughs> That's what he came One out One guy with. you should be very careful the way you pronounce his name, actually. That is not... Whether or not it's good or bad, it's not what Danny Ainge thought he was going to come out of the night with because he thought the draft picks were worth more than his colleagues did. He now, couldn't make this a deal. Is, this is why I think. This is why I think free agent players work out in the NBA more so than the NFL. Guaranteed contracts. I sure. had a great conversation with Jeannie Buss on my radio show one day, and I was talking about Greg Hardy and, and, and his situation, of course, in Dallas. And, you know, did you ever have a situation where you brought up that your father brought a player in and you weren't happy with she actually said I wasn't happy that they were bringing in Phil Jackson but look how that worked out <laughs> but her point was if Greg Hardy was a basketball player and he was a part of the Lakers organization because of the guaranteed money we as an organization we as an ownership we as coaches we are we are committed we have to make this work in the NFL that's not the case player doesn't work out whatever he, okay you've got his guaranteed money but you know what the rest it's not guaranteed see you out the door in the NBA, organizations are committed to these players. They know their money is locked down, and they're doing everything from soup to nuts, A to Z, to make this player work out. I don't believe that happens in the NFL. Yeah, I just, uh, I, I just think the writing's on the wall. I just think we see the modern-day NBA, and it's a direct result of the salary cap. If you're looking for a reason, that's why. Everybody has money to spend. The purpose of a draft, any sport, NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, baseball is to find talent on the cheap. Right. That's the purpose of a draft. You, and that's why it works in the NFL, by the way, because you're getting, to, you're getting to underpay a guy for what he's worth. And there's simply no need for that in the modern day NBA. You don't have to find. It's nice if you can. Don't get me wrong. It's nice if you can, but you don't need to. Yeah, but well, again, afford, it, it, you can afford proven commodities. It boils down to the fact that not every place in the NBA, in the NFL, mm -hmm. free agents will go anywhere. Buffalo, Jacksonville, it doesn't matter, big market, small market. That's not the case in the NBA. Guys want to play in certain cities, so you need the draft to do that. Paul George in Indiana, you know, I mentioned all the other examples that I had. I, I think that those are the things you have to look at. Not every team can compete the same way. It's why we had a lockout not that long ago in yeah. 2011 or whatever it was in the NBA. So I think that part factors into but the world changed, right? But the world has changed. Sure, but Danny Ainge also had the misfortune of having all those picks in one of the worst drafts we've had in a long time. There's really only two guys that we think are going to be real all-star impact players and then the rest there's about eight guys that you say to yourself in total you're like okay those guys can play and then everyone else is a crapshoot completely and that's every one of our analysts says that next year's draft is supposed to be according to these guys that work here loaded okay so he's gonna have another opportunity next year because he's still got Brooklyn's picks unfortunately for two more seasons he gets to swap picks with them next year and then they get it out right again <laughs> the year after that so he's gonna have more chances at it it's no different than what Bill Belichick does uh, I don't I don't fault Danny Ainge for doing what he did even though I again I agree with your overall premise but I don't fault him it's a lottery ticket man in, that's why Bill Belichick always trades back, gets more picks, because he figures, you know what? This thing, this whole thing is a crapshoot. It works. Shoot. It's a whole crapshoot, the whole thing. So let me just get more tickets, more chances to punch a ticket, and that's the route I'll take. And that's what Danny Ainge tried to do, and it didn't work this time around. Hey, basketball fans, I'm George Sedano on the latest NBA Lockdown podcast. ESPN basketball insider Jeff Goodman stops by to break down the draft with me and talk a little trades, too. Subscribe to the podcast and the Listen tab of the ESPN app. We know it's a quarterback-driven league, and it is widely regarded as the most valuable position. So with that being said, NFL.com compiled a list entering the 2016 season of the most valuable players, including and not including quarterbacks. So we begin with J.J. Watt. He comes in at number one, followed by Rob Gronkowski, Aaron Donald, Von Miller, Luke Keekley. That rounds up the top five. Then Antonio Brown comes in at six, followed by Julio Jones, Odell Beckham, Khalil Mack, and Patrick Peterson to round out the top ten. Anita, who is your non-quarterback MVP in the NFL? How can it not be J.J. Watt? I mean, three of the past four years winning Defensive Player of the Year. Um, he is kind of LT, Reggie White dominance with that defensive side of the football for the Houston Texans. His leadership, um, he brings it, his attitude. Uh, he just, I mean, he's, he's infectious. Love him or hate him, you've got to agree that he's infectious and he brings that swagger to the Texans. And then look at the Super Bowl. Look, this is a QB-driven league right now, right? Everybody, you know, had all their money on Cam Newton winning the Super Bowl, but Von Miller had something to say about that. It's a QB-driven league. How do you do that? How do you cut off the head of the snake? 
um, which of course is the quarterback with a great defensive lineman, a defensive end who's going to pin his ears back and come after him. And sure enough, that's what J.J. Watt brings to the table. How can he not be your most valuable player outside the quarterback position? He also position? contributes on offense, right? That's true. Days. That's true. Who you got? Is it me? It's you. I'm not. You I'm want not. To you want to you? Keep preparing. We'll go to George. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> the whole time. She time. said something, I and I just want to think. I sometimes no. said, eh, I want to look something you. up you, really you, quickly. You look. You do your homework. <laughs> okay. Uh, mine is simple. Um, and I, I said this. I was on the show, I think, like two years ago, and I said that Gronk is the greatest tight end in the history of the game already. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's any question about it. Remember two years ago when Tom Brady was struggling out of the gate? Yep. You want to know why Tom Brady was struggling out of the gate? Was Gronk not on the field? Yes. When everyone was panicking? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, when everyone was calling him washed up. Yeah. Look, Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback in the history of the game, in my opinion, okay? But he struggled a little bit when he didn't have Gronk. And that, to me, says it speaks volumes. When you're talking about the guy, the poster child of the quarterback position in Tom Brady, and I know you can love him, you can hate him as well, and you can call him cheaters all you want. You only call them cheaters because you lost to them, probably. That's usually how this thing works out, unless you're the Giants. So... Uh, <laughs> I got a point in me. Hey, well, you cover them. That's why. So <laughs> she's she's a bigger fan. Okay. Amen. There yeah. you go. So to me, like, there is no question that it's Rob Gronkowski. Uh, you can affect the game only so many ways when when you're on defense. And I'm not saying that pass rushers aren't important. It's still one of the top four most important positions. Um, you know, pass rusher, left cornerback, tackle. left tackle, and quarterback. But there are outliers in life sometimes. There are anomalies, and I think Gronk is that. He looks like a freak of nature. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. No one's been built like that. He almost won that game in Denver single-handedly in that AFC title game, okay? So I, despite all the stuff that was going on around Brady, despite Von Miller breathing down his neck every time, Gronk almost saved the day. That, I don't think I've seen a guy who's a pass catcher have that kind of impact since Jerry Rice. No, he's, so he's totally a freak. He's yeah, totally so freak to me... He like, flips water jugs. Check that out online. Yeah, yeah, I know. I've seen it. Uh, so, like, to me, since Jerry Rice, there hasn't been a pass catcher that affects the game the, the way he does. So to me, that's why I go with Gronk. And that's, look... J.J. Watt is the best defensive player in the league. I'm not debating that. I'm just telling you, I would go with Gronk. Also, in, in regard to the Texans, I mean, this is a team, let's face it, they haven't had a quarterback in, in forever and a day. Now Brock Osweiler's there. Yeah. Really excited. Don't sleep on the Texans. I think the Texans make it to the playoffs this year. I really do. But Weak division, so I can see But it. with that being said, I, I mean, their success without a quarterback has been, in my opinion, solely based on, on the performance of J.J. Watt and what he's been able to do for this franchise and this organization. And we're talking about a defensive lineman. And this is a quarterback right. league. So you're going to have to give me a minute. Okay. Because I need to build this argument. I'm okay. going to take bits and pieces of both of yours to support it. Okay. Because my guy's not even on that top ten list. Really? He didn't even make, apparently, somehow, the ten most valuable players non-quarterback in the NFL. Uh-oh. The floor is yours. There are outliers in life. There are outliers that buck trends. Thank you. I'm going to borrow Malcolm that. That's Malcolm Gladwell. I'm going to borrow that. Thank you, George. Carrying a non-quarterback team into the playoffs. Thank you, Nita. I'm going to borrow that because the most valuable player in the NFL who doesn't play the quarterback position is Adrian Peterson. Now, I understand very well what's happened to the running back position over the past several years. That at least financially, it's been significantly downgraded. That everyone seems to think they can get a running back wherever they want. That is, everybody except the Dallas Cowboys who are willing to spend a top four pick on it. They may get it this year, though. This guy, besides set aside 11,000 career rushing yards, these are the two things you need to know about why Adrian Peterson is the MVP of the league with no quarterbacks being taken into account. Because he rushed for 1,400 yards, led the league again last year, 1,485 again. But the stat that really matters is 327 touches. No, I'm sorry, attempts, 357 touches. To your point, the ball is in this guy's hand all the time. You are affecting the game over and over and over. And how does he affect the game? With no quarterback. With Gus Farratt, Brett Favre, Christian Ponder, and Teddy Bridgewater, he has taken the Minnesota Vikings to the playoffs four times. With those guys as quarterbacks, this man has carried them single-handedly into the playoffs. This guy has carried that franchise for, what is it now, at least... Uh, Wait, about a decade. Uh, almost a decade. Yeah, about a decade. Clearly the best running back over the last decade. One of the best running backs of all time. And just because the position itself is one we don't value anymore, you're wrong if you don't value this guy in particular. That's solid. I like it. No, that's a good oh, argument. Hey, I, I, I like it. Listen, I wouldn't fight you on it. I, I think we're splitting hairs here with all three guys, personally. I mean, that's the way I look at it. But 
Um, yeah, I, I just think that you're taking guys who are all all timers mm -hmm. at their position, and you can make a fair yeah. argument for them. JJ Watt, as you mentioned, I mean, even Lawrence Taylor has talked about he's the best player he's seen since yeah. him. Okay, and Adrian Peterson may go down as uh, look. I, I don't know if he's gonna he's gonna eclipse the rushing record. Uh, my guess is maybe not, but. When you look at him as a freak of nature, I think he's probably, if you were going to cast a running back in a movie, you would cast him same like you do with Gronk. So I think, that, look, I know that this show is about debating and yelling and screaming at each other, but I, I think on this one we can all agree that we all have a point. The one thing in, in regard to Adrian Peterson, again, this, this is kind of because in our pre-production meeting, we didn't, we didn't, you didn't throw out this name. So um, I'm, I'm a little taken <laughs> he back. He likes the curveball. you got to be ready with does. it. I know he does. I know he's you ready. Do, but him coming off of ACL reconstruction in the short period of time that he did and have the season he did to me was absolutely remarkable. I've had seven knee surgeries, three ACL wow. meniscus. Really? Yeah. And it, it to me, I, I just, it, I'm in awe. And so you threw a curveball, but I'm, I'm with you. I'm not going well, to, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to change my JJ Watt pick, but Offensively, I have to tell you what, out of these two offensive players, I have to agree well, with Well, I'll tell you this. I, over, I, I, over you I, I, I will revisit this if the league wrongfully suspends Tom Brady for four games and Garoppolo has to go in there. If Gronk saves the day Jimmy for those G. four games, then, uh, then we can revisit eight. this. And that's ultimately, you always end up here when it comes to an MVP debate. We do it in basketball every year. What's the definition of an MVP? Is it the best player on the field? Is it the best player in the league? To me, it's the one who single-handedly can change the outcome of a team the easiest, the most responsible for changing the outcome. That's why it's been LeBron. It's always been LeBron in the NBA because he is the one that changes the outcome, takes a 30-win team to the finals. He's the one. It's not about whether Steph you know, is great or the second-best player or had a better season even. LeBron defines MVP. And when you touch the ball, 357 times in a season, you're directly impacting what's happening with your team on a play-to-play -play basis. And the argument against Peterson is a positional argument. It's that the running back position is no longer valued like it once was. And I would just say, and you not... Cowboys valuing it. Well, and I love this about the Cowboys. Zig when others zag. If everyone else believes something's no longer a value, go ahead and invest in it because you're getting great assets on the cheap. And if everyone wants to discount... The problem is he's not getting on the... You're not getting yeah. Adrian Peterson on the cheap anymore. Or Ezekiel Elliott, by the right, way. Right. The fourth pick gets right. paid pretty well. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, no, you're not getting those on the cheap anymore, but they are. But the point is, they are undervalued. Right. Like at least the, in the, the public, outliers are in the are public getting mind. Paid eventually, the, yeah. the positional value has drugged down a guy here who should be the MVP. And just to piggyback, one quick point is, and he did all of this without a top-notch quarterback. And, and yeah. no knock on Teddy B. I actually, I love Teddy B. And I really, yeah, but it's just no, no, listen kid. to me. Yeah. Open it up for this young kid this year, please. I love Teddy B. But without a, a, a superstar quarterback and also a receiving core. You've got defenses. They're not nine. They're putting all 11 in the box, and he's still putting up those numbers. Some unbelievable. Yeah, look, North Turner knows how to run an offense. I mean, he did it in Dallas. I mean, look, he had Emmitt Smith in Dallas. His couple of years in Miami, he had uh, Ricky Williams. He had uh, Ladanian Tomlinson in San Diego. He likes to ride the running back, and and th this is no different. Than I'm that. surprised. No. Doing. Not top I'm, 10? No, I'm surprised no love for Von Miller. I thought one of you guys would have went with the Super Bowl MVP. Or no, look, he's great. I, I would say he's the second best pass rusher in the league, though. I, that's why. I mean, just based on, on Watt. what J.J. Watt. Right, on what J.J. Watt is. All right, Gronk, J.J. Watt, AP, that's what it is. So, the mother of Giants rookie first round pick Eli Apple filmed dropping her son off at Giants OTAs and documented the event with a series of tweets. This is so cute. Eli's first day as a New York Giant. It's hard to turn off the mommy meter at these pivotal moments. Corny and proud, hashtag TBT. We enjoy these important life moments as a family. You only get one first day of OTAs, plus we're close by, so yay. Will, yes. I want to start with you. I don't know if you think it's as cute as I do. What's your reaction to Eli and his mother, Annie? Well, with this specific moment, her dropping him off at, at OTAs, I have no problem with that. It, it's Cute. It's cute. It's cute. It was like it's vinegar cute. on your mouth, like trying to say it was cute. It's, it's, it's cute. So cute. Here's, you know so what? proud. It's, yeah, and I've got kids, and I get it, yeah. and I get it. And even though he's a grown man, he is a grown man, um, he can be proud and share these moments, and that's nice. But she's walking a, a line. She's walking a very dangerous line, in my mind. Um, and I'm very well aware that, that Annie Apple works here at ESPN, and she's, I'm sure, a lovely lady. I've never met her. I've never spoken with her, and she'll probably walk this line fairly successfully. But this idea that family members are becoming celebrities, family members of 
the central figure in the story, which is the elite athlete, is a real problem. And we just had this issue with Aisha Curry tweeting her NBA conspiracy theories a week ago. God, it was only a week ago. A week I know, ago. That seems like a long time ago. A week ago. And then we had a conversation about whether or not people are allowed to speak their mind, family members, wives. It, went into the, it veered into whether or not women, if this is a statement against women speaking their mind. It's none of those things. It's simply this. If you are a periphery figure to the main storyline, and every family member is. You need to stay out. I mean, the most obvious example, by the way, is clearly, right, Miko. Miko Grimes has illustrated for us the problem with this. Has he found a, a job yet, by the way? He's yes. in Tampa. Okay. Yes, he has. All right. We have no idea how much it cost him, <laughs> this entire situation. But, you know, it's even you can play it at the little league level. I have sons. When, they are, when you are at the field, don't be the dad who's yelling onto the field. Don't be the dad who's walking onto the field. Don't be the dad who's joysticking. Don't be the mom who's commenting or the girlfriend who has something to say on everything that happens on the field. You are only hurting one person, and that's the one you love. Because ultimately, in that locker room, with that coach, with his buddies, it will come back on him, not on you. Or even the media, it will come back on him. You're a periphery figure. Stay a periphery figure. Stay out of center stage. It's not your story. Okay, so I, I knew we were going to you know, mm -hmm. embark on this topic. So I had the pleasure of speaking to Annie Apple prior to the Love show. It. And a few things she said. Number one is she's been tweeting and she's been doing this before Eli Apple even played at Ohio State University. This is what she does. This is who she is. And I think because of who she is is a big reason why I think ESPN hit an absolute home run hiring her. I can't wait to see her contribution on Sunday and Monday talking NFL. Her insight is so unique. I host a sports talk radio show in New York during the entire O.J. Simpson um, Document. The documentary, documentary yep. I had her on my show, not to talk about football, but to talk about the documentary. Her insights were intriguing. They were enlightening. They were different. They were out of the box. She is a talent. I get what you're saying. Eli Apple, first round draft pick, the Giants. If anybody should have some concerns, maybe it's the, it's the Giants because it's not the way they roll. They like to be under the radar. You know, they're polar opposites than the Jets. The Jets more than likely would have a parent that would be on social media and, mm -hmm. and, and, and be more outspoken. But I like what she's doing. It's refreshing. It's different. She's a great follow. I, I want to say she's gone from 200 to 20,000 followers. Um, and it's, it's a different perspective, I think, that she's going to offer us as football fans. The mother of a son who plays for the New York football giants, I think she's intelligent. I think she's responsible. They're a tight-knit family. I think that I, you said she's going to walk the line and she's going to do it very well. I think you're right, Will. I think she will. I don't think that she's going to, you know. Let's hope. But let's hope. But I, I, I believe in her. I believe in her. I know her. I think she's a great lady, and I think, I think she's got great insight. And I'm really excited how she's going to contribute Can on ESPN this year. I, I'm sorry, George. It's not just that she needs to walk the line and fall on the right side of it. It's Eli Apple better be good. Right. That's He's what I was going to get. This you mean because then ugly. she's going to get the criticism? Right. But it seems like she could handle it. I think she could handle it. Well, here's the thing. And, and I'm, all, I'm okay with Aisha Curry saying what she said uh, until she used the word rigged. I think yeah. you have to be smart in these situations. Look, if you're in the public eye in any way, shape, or form, and she is, and Aisha Curry was, and Eli Apple's mom, Annie Apple, is, you have to understand, as Will pointed out, you're only hurting the people you love the most. So you have to think before you tweet. What does Herm Edwards always say? Don't press sin, right? You have to think before you and tweet. And I love the inflection. Or put anything on, it. on social media. <laughs> like, you have to be careful about that. Uh, when I was in Miami, the Dolphins drafted a cornerback named Nolan Carroll, who I believe was with the Eagles this past season. Uh, his mom was the lieutenant governor of the state of Florida. And kids are mean. People are mean. Guys like the locker room, they're like big kids at times. And anytime his mom was up there saying something, it was a discussion in the locker room at times. And I was told this by multiple players. And they rag on him and get on him. And after a while, that stuff's going to bother whether it was Nolan Carroll, whether it's going to be Eli Apple. Like, if she says something, even if it's just a Freudian slip or just something comes out the wrong way, okay, the guys in the locker room, are how are they going to deal with that? Then the coach has got to deal with that. And you know of all sports, football, because you've covered it the most, they hate the word distraction. Every stupid little thing to them is a distraction. I think some of that is just... Nonsense. Like it just, I think they, they get a little too controlling at times. But you know they overreact to stuff. We turn every little morsel in the NFL into a mountain. But, but
but all she's saying is that she's just enjoying the moment that her son's going to. Okay. Right. No, but she's we're talking. We're she, projecting. Yeah. Right? Will and I are talking about the future. She's not coming potential out with proclamations behavior. like he's going to be rookie of the year. No, 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 no. I'll say. And look, are you humming? She needs to know why. We're talking about her. Right. And she does. She's giving me no indication Correct. that she doesn't know that. Correct. But you need to know why we're talking about you. Same with Aisha Curry. We're talking about you because of your husband or your son. They are the story. So if you do anything, and again, she hasn't. But if you do anything that distracts him, distracts his team, distracts away She's from what is his story, she raised the story. And if this is authentic to who she is, Anna and Aisha Curry, if that's who they are, I choose to be more private. But is that that is you know what? I'm saying, but I'm saying is it fair? if that's who you are, and you, and you want and you want to put it out there on social media, but why is it not? is it fair that we bring the Curry and the Grimes baggage? onto Annie Apple. I don't think that's fair. But you know what? I we think used she's, to, we used I to think she's a Richard totally Williams. different person. We're already expecting the negative because of those instances and what happened and what took place there. I don't think it's fair. Right. I think, I, I, again, I, I think this is a good thing, not just for ESPN, not just for the Giants, but I think for football fans in general, I think she's going to be refreshing. Anita, I don't dispute that she's going to be good, and it's a good thing for ESPN. Though I will say this, if I were... You know, if I were running this company and I was working with her, I would just tell her this. Everything that we've discussed here, just be very careful what you say. You know, think it out before you actually go out and say it because every little morsel she puts out there yes. is going to be dissected. That's just the way that league works. I just think you have to ask yourself, would you do it? You know, you're right, Molly, but there are however many players in the NFL, there are that many moms. There are that many dads. And not all of them are choosing to be part of the story. Yet they were part of their kids being raised. They were part of their yeah. kids' careers. And so, would you, the, I but think, she was would you before. do it? She was doing this before she, he that doesn't mean right, but the spotlight that doesn't is bigger. Writer. But that spotlight doesn't mean he's right. Right? There are all little league dads. There are little league dads. OTA, she's dropping off. She's excited. I told you when That's I started. I told you when I started. It's not this particular incident. Okay. I wouldn't criticize it. I think she's it's on the right side of the line. It's what she potentially could do. And it's the potential role she's playing. The role comes all baked in. She hasn't done it yet, though. Well, she's a no. She's a media speaker. No, but I'm saying she hasn't done it in terms of with this example she hasn't done and has she said anything she yet hasn't that bothers made you? a mistake no, no she has so not. far so but you're good. anticipating yeah, of course yeah, so yeah and i think so it's good. probably although she hasn't made a mistake it's just an unwise role to be in i think there are many parents who choose not to do this and i don't think it's limited to pro athletes even though she was doing this before if you have kids at all you've seen the parents who'd play this role on the field and it hurts their kids i, I think what will's trying to say is there are landmines everywhere potentially with this yeah. and i think that she's got to be careful where she steps uh, that that's it and so you're looking out for right. her it's, it's of the not like we're not saying that and, and to him as well we're not saying that she shouldn't do this we're just saying she just needs well you're saying yeah, maybe maybe uh, but he's saying shut it down don't you, hit send you her gotta, edwards you got to be careful you yeah. absolutely have to be careful and in i think situation. she knows that i think she's intelligent enough she worked she worked in the media i want to say she worked for nbc mm -hmm. I, and during 9-11. I mean, she's an intelligent woman. She knows this industry. She knows how it works. I, I, I really, I, I believe she's going to cross that changed. line. Wait, but media's changed a lot since then, and all you, all, one tweet changes everything, okay? We should all, to be honest, be fearful of what we say or what we tweet at any given moment, because it can be taken in the wrong context, and that's it. And really quick, today is her birthday. So happy, happy birthday. Happy Mrs. birthday. Happy birthday. But listen, I, I'm conflicted at this. Welcome one of my, to the Giants family. You know, know. One of my, I'm not really a part of it. One of my buddies brings his dad to work every day, Levitard, and his dad's the star of that freaking show. I love that. So Keep it in the family. Right. Listen, but none of my family's on social media to stay that way. Sources told ESPN.com that after Chris Dunn unexpectedly lasted until the fifth pick, the T-Wolves drafted the Providence guard, then pushed hard to see if they could work out a trade with the Bulls for Jimmy Butler. The talks ultimately fizzled after some initial optimism that a deal could get done. Bulls GM Gar Foreman denied that there was ever any talk about Butler during the draft. The Bulls have already dealt Derrick Rose to the Knicks, of course. So, George, what should they do with Butler? Just trade him at this point. Look. At best, the relationship between the players in that locker room last year and their coach was indifferent. That's what I was told by people who covered that, that team every single day. And not just one person, multiple people. Jimmy Butler needs to get out of there for Fred Hoiberg's sake. Because him and Hoiberg have had a frosty relationship at times. They've already dangled him out there. And Gar Foreman can say whatever he wants. That he knows he's been dangled out there. He's not dumb. So... Get rid of him, start fresh, clear the deck for Fred Hoiberg. He's a young coach, coach young players, reboot the thing, and go that way. I think he's one of the best two-way players in the NBA. They lose Derrick Rose. Now this is his team. I'm kind of looking at the analogy in regard to what's going on mm -hmm. with Kirk Cousins in Washington. It's now his team. Sometimes that elevates you as, as an athlete and as the alpha male. 
if I'm Chicago, I'm keeping him. I want to see what he can do. This is your team, my friend. Make make it make it work. I'd like to see the Bulls keep him. I want them to keep him, too. First of all, this whole debate, this whole drama last night about trading him for the fifth pick, I think illustrates my point about the value of picks. Milwaukee thought, uh, I mean, sorry, Minnesota thought they were going to be able to pull Jimmy Butler away for Chris Dunn. No. No, you can't. Value not the same. Second, I buy what Ryan Russillo said. Just because you're in a reboot, just because you're rebuilding, doesn't mean you've got to start from scratch. Doesn't mean you've got to get rid of everybody. Jimmy, they are on a reboot, right? I mean, Noah's gone, Rose is gone. Yeah. Keep Butler. Start with him. Thank you guys so much. This was a lot of fun today. I know you'll be back Friday. You'll be back Tuesday. I'm on vacation. I will be back July 14. Enjoy. Thank you. I'm excited. Everybody have a great weekend. We appreciate you, and we'll see you soon. This weekend, Corey Seager and the Dodgers head east to face Starling Marte and the Pittsburgh Pirates. The other way for Corey Seager. That's some kind of power. Saturday at 6 Eastern and Sunday at 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio.